Dr. Lee, you talk in your new book about certain foods which can impact how much fat we store on our bodies. Now, before we get to those specific foods, I wonder if you can talk me through some of the common foods that people are consuming that they think are healthy, but actually are not. You know, this is where I think we all get confused by the surround sound of marketing of things that are supposedly healthy. And I think that you can think about like uh, 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 diet sodas being better than regular uh, sugar sweet, regular sugar sweetened sodas. Not true. Diet sodas with uh, artificial sweeteners damage our gut health, which then damages our metabolism, which can actually have tremendous impact in our body's metabolism. Another one is fruit juice. Uh, uh, look, I enjoy drinking the taste of fruit juice, but when you guzzle fruit juice, which many people do, it's a problem. I'll give you an example. Uh, a, I love oranges, uh, especially when they're in season during the winter. I love eating a regular juicy sweet orange. I, I love all the fiber that's in it. I love the taste of the whole orange. Um, and, and it's very sweet, uh, but a single orange is very nutrient dense. I could guzzle, uh, it would take me a few minutes to eat an orange, but I could guzzle down a tall glass of orange juice, which it would take eight oranges to make in 30 seconds, right? And so that's an example of where you can easily overload um, the sugars, the, the fruit sugars by having a, tall glass of its juice instead of eating the whole fruit. So that's an example, like lots of fruit juices. And some of the fruit juices you get in a store are also sweetened. And so people don't check the ingredients to look at all those other additives uh, that are in there uh, as well. You know, we know that coffee and tea are also um, healthy beverages, but if you take a look at some of the flavored coffees, you know, the drive throughs you get your handed that special seasonal version with the pumpkin or whatever, um, you know, a lot of those uh, flavors, as tasty as they may be, I, I even like them, uh, you know, they're artificial. They're, artif they're artificially flavored, artificially sweetened, uh, and, and that also takes a something that's healthy and makes it, um, frankly, not just less healthy, but actually unhealthy. Uh, another example would be plant-based um, uh, foods, you know, the plant-based burgers that they talked about that everyone says is a healthier version than uh, a, uh, you know, a regular burger. Well, look, we, we know that ultra-processed foods that you buy anywhere are not good for our overall health. And in fact, it compromises our metabolism when we eat too many ultra-processed foods. And although something that might be plant-based uh, uh, sounds healthy, in fact, when it's ultra processed, it winds up being something less than healthy and f falls squarely in the box of ultra processed foods. And so it's sort of a bit of buyer beware. Be careful of what be careful about not being snowed by the marketing messages that are out there. Understand what we're looking for uh, in terms of healthy foods and kind of exclude everything that's that's not. Yeah, I appreciate you outlining some of those common foods there. You know, as you were talking there, Dr. Lee, the word that came up for me was nuance. There's a bit of nuance here. Tea and coffee are healthy drinks for most people. Lots of these blue zones around the world are consuming tea, coffee, and water as their main drinks, as you write about in your new book. But they're not probably putting in the syrups and all the flavors and all the things. So coffee can be healthy for some people in the right dose at the right time, potentially can turn into something quite unhealthy, depending on what you're putting in it. And this whole idea of ingredient labels, I think is something that will come up time and time again. You write about this beautifully in your book. What about something like bread? I think bread fits into this. Bread is one of those foods that is consumed all over the world, but there are probably some breads that for some people are health promoting, whereas others are not so good, are they? You know, it, 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 it's so true. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the idea of bread. I actually think of bread and wine as two categories of foods that date back to the origins of our humanity, right? So basically, when humans started to put together their societies thousands of years ago, we fermented grapes, we made bread. They're some of the elemental foods that, that, that characterize um, sort of human society from a cultural sense. And one of the things that I think is quite um, challenging 
is first the quality of the ingredient that goes into uh, the product. So for bread, as an example, uh, the, the least expensive, softest, longest lasting breads that you can buy in the grocery store, in the supermarkets, are the ones that are made with the lowest quality uh, flour and that have lots of other preservatives added to it to allow it to kind of survive the the the, the centuries. Like some of these breads probably could stay uh, intact in a pyramid, you know, for thousands of years. Uh, I kid you not. And so, and yet those are some of the cheapest ones that people are are, are, are accustomed to, maybe from childhood. Your yeah. Our mom might have fed us this and made our sandwiches out of this, and we become accustomed to having cheap bread. That's one thing is the quality of the grain used for something as elemental as bread. Second is really that, you know, whether we're having whole grain or whether actually ultra processed uh, 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 flour can also make a difference. There's lots of different types of, of, of grains uh, that can be used to make bread. And then of course, there are some uh, historically important breads like sourdough, which in fact, has uh, uh, microbiome, probiotic starters that are good for our gut health. For example, like Lactobacillus ruteri, it happens to be one of the starters. It's found in our gut bacteria. It's actually developed over the centuries of humans making sourdough bread generation after generation to develop its own probiotic bacteria uh, that grows right in the bread itself in the little dough that gets pinched and saved from baker to baker and passed down through the generations. Um, so I think that there's also nuance, as you say. And then, of course, there's something that's maybe less nuanced, which is volume. A little bread probably is just fine. But eating bread the way that we are often served bread or accustomed to eating bread, which is wolfing down large quantities of bread, that clearly, like anything else uh, uh, that is is consumed in excess, definitely can compromise our health. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. It's interesting what you said there about quantity. This is something I've learned about in my own life, not necessarily dealing with the patients, of course, that's taught me a lot over the years. But I have experimented with wearing a CGM for a couple of weeks, a few times a year, not all the time, but now and again. And I have learned whether it's white rice or bread, the quantity makes a huge difference on the impact it has on my body. And so that device for me has been a really great learning tool to go, hey, you know, if you want to enjoy this, you can, but if you want it to not cause long-term health consequences, maybe just go easy on the volume and the amount. And you know what? I probably changed the amount I was consuming. Let's say white rice, for example. Let's say I'm going to have white rice in the evening with my meal, which I grew up in an Indian family. It's a it's a food that I grew up eating. But I can actually have a really small amount now and enjoy it and actually not see it impact my blood sugar. So that's been really quite amazing for me. Have you experienced things like this yourself as well? And I guess, is that what you're getting at with quantity? Yes. I mean, you know, I, I'm so glad you brought the, the continuous glucose monitoring as a non-invasive way for us to measure ourselves. I mean, you know, the, 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 this, and I think this is where the future is going, giving us the ability relatively easily to see how we're doing from, from moment to moment, day to day is super helpful. Uh, for me, uh, a, a simple device that I've actually experimented with similarly to is, a. Uh, I don't know if you've seen these, uh, uh, it's like a breathalyzer for whether you're burning carbs or fat. It's called a lumen device. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's it's quite interesting uh, the 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 fact that it breaks down a respiratory equivalent uh, for your metabolism just through a breathalyzer. You know, if a policeman can pull you over to the side of the road for drinking too much alcohol, why can't we actually be at home and measure in the morning as as I sometimes do occasionally just to check in to see how I've been done. And, and to your point, exactly. I found that when I'm actually moderate and, and mindful in what I consume, not only in terms of what, but also the quantity of, of, of how much I ate, I actually do better. And that's actually a positive reinforcement. So, mm. you know, I think these little signals that actually help us get smarter about our own behavior and what's good for us, it's not a big ask. It's actually a very easy thing to do. 
Yeah. It's, it's interesting what we've just been talking about, how we might be able to use tech or you know, all kinds of things, blood tests, whatever it might be, to actually learn what's working for us and what's not working for us, I think really speaks to the message in your new book, which is very much one of personalization. You've done a beautiful job at outlining, I think, 150 plus foods in that book, right? These foods are going to help you burn fat. They're going to help you lose weight, give you more energy, whatever it might be you're looking for, these foods are going to help you. But you really beautifully put across this idea, which I'm a huge fan of, that you have to personalize this for you. If some of those foods on that list you don't like or don't fit you and your culture and your upbringing, that's okay. You know, there's other foods you can focus on. And, you know, you're not prescribing an actual diet per se in this book. More, I think, a way of eating and you're trying to help people with, I guess, some some base principles. I think you say in the book, actually, Dr. Lee, that you prefer people to be mindful eaters rather than prescriptive eaters. 100%. I think one of the things that makes diets fail, and by the way, my title of my, my new book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, is a trick title purposefully. It's not a diet book. It's actually an anti-diet book, which is why it's called Eat to Beat Your Diet, the science tells us that if we eat mindfully and if we make good choices and we actually think about the volume, sort of what we eat and how we eat, we can use the equipment, the hardwiring, the operating system that's in our bodies to be able to work on our behalf without going to these extreme fad uh, interventions, fad diets. I mean, you, as you now know, it, it goes crazy when people are, we're in a society obsessed with weight loss whether it's, uh, you know, prescription drugs for weight loss uh, or whether it's sucking out fat from your cheeks. Uh, there's lots and lots of intense things that people do. The problem is, you, you know, they don't last. And for me, a healthy diet is something that you can actually, is sustainable. Uh, you can enjoy it. It can become second nature. And I think one of the things that I also want to add to your um, idea of the the just the opposite of prescriptive diet and a more natural personalized diet is aligning your life patterns your eating patterns with what gives you joy because food you know is different from supplements or medicines you know we talk about food as medicine yes food is medicine but food is in in so many ways but yet food is not medicine because nobody gets joy from actually taking a medicine if I wrote a prescription or you wrote a prescription and you gave me a prescription and I went to the pharmacy to fill it out and I started taking the pills or I went to a hospital to get an infusion, I guarantee you it's not going to give me joy. But if we were to have a conversation about foods that can actually activate and elevate our body's natural processes to help us become healthier, and we can pick among those food ingredients and combine them in ways uh, in that that do are delicious and do bring us joy. That's something that would be wonderful uh, to be able to adopt, and that to me is what's important. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very clear from reading this book and your previous one. To be fair, that you are a foodie, that you enjoy cooking, you enjoy observing different cultures, you like putting it all together. So there's a real joy, I think, in reading the book because your love of food absolutely comes through really beautifully. There's quite a lot of new science in there. A lot of the time I feel people think, well, we know everything there is to know now. We just need to do the things that people are telling us. And while some of the principles, I guess, we know about, there's quite a few areas of science around metabolism and brown fat, which I thought were really, really interesting that I'd love to explore with you. Before we get to that, I wonder if we can talk about gut health and weight loss, and in particular, fat loss. You've touched on it a couple of times already in terms of the probiotics within certain breads. One of the foods you mentioned at the start, which can be problematic, was diet soft drinks. And again, a lot of people will say, well, why, Dr. Lee? You know, surely that's better than my sugar sweetened soft drink. And this all kind of speaks to gut health. So I wonder if you could talk to these themes a little bit and help people understand what that relationship is. Right. Well, gut health is something that, you know, we we live with 
gut health until our gut's unhealthy, right? All of us have experienced this. We feel perfectly fine. We don't think about our gut health until we have that crampy, bloated, gassy, uncomfortable feeling. That's our body, our gut telling us there's something wrong in the neighborhood of those 40, 39 trillion bacteria living in our cecum, which is really the final part of our colon. And the thing that is really remarkable is what these gut bacteria do for us when it comes to our metabolism. Well, we're just beginning to peel back the layers of the onion to discover how important gut health is for our metabolism. For example, we know that a properly functioning neighborhood ecosystem of gut bacteria, our microbiome, as we know, actually helps makes our uh, our body's ability to use insulin and to absorb glucose more efficient. Now, let me just explain, put that in the context for your listeners in terms of something that they probably have heard about, but maybe didn't connect with gut health. So every time we eat food, we put it in our mouth, our pancreas releases a hormone called insulin. And that insulin combined with the food that we've absorbed through our stomach into our bloodstream draws the energy into our cells so that we're actually able to use that energy from the food we eat in order to power our body. Now, our gut bacteria actually helps to contribute to how smooth that process is. When our gut bacteria is unhealthy, the ecosystem is disturbed. Think about how easy it is to disturb a beautiful pond in your backyard. If you were to take a gallon of dish soap and just start pouring it into the pond, you're going to start poisoning some of the tadpoles and the frogs and the natural wildlife there, and the, and the pond is not going to be healthy. That's basically what happens when we consume things like diet sodas. It's been shown now that many of those artificial sweeteners, non-nutritive sweeteners, when we consume them, alter our gut microbiome. They change the neighborhood. And how do we know that this actually has uh, an impact on our metabolism? We know this from clinical studies because ironically, even though people drink diet sodas so they don't gain weight uh, with, with sugar, ironically, Many people do gain weight if they consume enough diet soda. So if you poison your gut microbiome sufficiently and you and you disrupt your metabolism sufficiently, even though you're having, quote, diet soda, that's just a name on the can. The reality is, is that we're actually changing the biology in our body in such a way that our body is actually going to start to grow uh, uh, body fat and use our food, our inner our fuel source, much less efficiently. So... Many other things can actually disturb our gut health as well. Antibiotics, which are so commonly prescribed, over-prescribed perhaps, might be the right word uh, to say in, in many societies. Um, I think that uh, overconsumption of alcohol can clearly interfere with your gut microbiome. Ultra-processed foods, all those things, are back to the reading the ingredient label, that we don't do enough. I mean, honestly, it's it's not a big deal to pick up something that you might put in your shopping cart, but just take a moment before it goes in to turn the box to the side and look at what's actually inside it. If you don't recognize those ingredients, if you can't pronounce them, think, are these ingredients potentially impacting my gut health, my gut microbiome? And if so, could that have an adverse effect on my metabolism? That is something that we should all be thinking about as we just cruise through the shopping, uh, through the supermarket, putting things into our car. Yeah, it really speaks to... I think this idea behind fat loss, I want to talk about fat shortly, you know, what it is, why it's not as harmful maybe as it's been made out to be. You make a very compelling case for the benefits of fat, um, which I think is really, really nuanced, very, very important for us to understand. But there is this prevailing view out there in society that it is simply an equation, okay? It is calories in versus calories out, or let's be a bit more precise than that. It's if your body is burning more calories than it is actually taking in, you're going to lose weight. But the question is, how does that occur, right? How are we going to actually cause our body to burn off more than it's taking in? And sometimes it's about lots of different inputs, right? So let's just go back to these artificial sweetness for a minute. And the reason I'm pausing here, Dr. Lee, is because this appears to be one of the most controversial areas 
you know, sugar sweetened drinks versus diet drinks. Now, for many years, certain scientists have been advising we proceed with caution and say, listen, I'm not sure about these things. There appears to be early evidence that the gut microbiome is getting affected. Now, when you say that online, typically a lot of the views that come back are, that's a load of rubbish, right? Uh, It's surely better than having the sugar-sweetened drink. And it becomes very, very uh, inflammatory, like many things to do with foods these days, to be fair. And my take as a doctor has always been to adopt the precautionary principle. A lot of these things are very new. They haven't been around for long. I personally just don't like advising people consume them. Doesn't mean I know for sure, or this was a few years ago, but I was like, guys, until we know more, I think you're better off not having soft drinks. You're better off not just going to a different version of soft drink. Let's try and get you off them by and large. So I wonder if you could speak to that. Why is it so controversial and why are you so confident to be able to tell people, cut out these diet drinks from your diet? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I I have the same general outlook as you and my own stance and my advice is very similar, which is take a precautionary stance um, and be be informed. Look, I mean, life is for the living. So we're all, we all do things that yeah. are, that are maybe not so good for us from time to time. But, you know, every time you, you, every time you commit yourself to making a decision like that, just be aware. It may not be so good for you. We, we, we may not be a hundred percent certain. And of course, everyone's a little bit different, but here's what I write about in my book. Cause I was deeply researching this What's the role of beverages? People will say, well, fruit fruit juices must be okay because they come from fruits, which are plant-based. Aren't you talking about eating plant-based foods? Yes. But again, this is, uh, you know, back to this idea of nuance, which is really important. I think that the science of the body is continuously changing and advancing so that we understand more and more what the impact is of something that we might consume and how our body responds to it. 10 years ago, there were some inklings that maybe diet soft drinks might not be so good for our metabolism. Now that we've dived deeper into gut health, we're beginning to see more concrete data that suggests that there is an impact. We also do know more greatly than ever that our gut health is so important for our overall health. And so when we start to put together this hypothesis and start to stitch together some of the information, the precautionary position is, you know, be really careful about diet sodas and be careful about sodas in general. And so for my book, one of the things that I wanted to do is just to write about like, where's the safe harbor and all this, right? By the way, I I take people in my book through the, as I was writing this section of my book on foods, I wrote for the reader, uh, imagining that they were sitting in the grocery cart, like we all did when we were kids in our mom's grocery cart, and she was pushing us through the grocery store. And what I'm doing is kind of whispering in your ear, telling you what is healthy and good for your metabolism to put in the grocery cart. And when we get to the beverage aisle, okay, there's a whole chapter on beverages. I really come to this conclusion that um, there are three beverages that I call the holy trinity for health. It's water, it's tea, and it's coffee in their elemental forms. Right. Not the stuff that's got the syrups and things put in them, not necessarily the flavored waters necessarily, but in their elemental forms. These three beverages all have very, very compelling uh, and deep evidence that they actually benefit our physiology. They help our body do its things um, in, in a way. Everything else that's a beverage, when you consume it, there are ways of actually bringing joy and great flavor and taste. Uh, don't deny that. But they're actually uh, introducing things in your body that may or may not be so good for you. Look, everyone enjoys a sweet drink, of course. You know, the remember when we were kids and you went to a function and uh, your your a parent or an adult pours you a cup of punch. You know, it's of a color that just doesn't occur in nature, and you drink it, and oh, it's so great. Look, this is who we are. We're humans. We enjoy sweet things. Our brain is hardwired to yeah. enjoy sweet things. But I think that one of the things is if you have the awareness that things that we may enjoy may not be that good for us. And we're mindful about restricting, limiting, consuming only modestly. That's a good first step. I don't believe that people should go hardcore uh, and, and just come off of everything that they enjoy. No. Nor do I really believe in, in um, uh, villainizing foods. I think we should look at all the data 
And, and nothing speaks more to this than even something that is beneficial to you, if you consume it in excess, can overwhelm our bodies. We're just human. Yeah. I think it's a couple of really important points to pause upon there. What is, you know, as you were talking about diet soft drinks, you said that, look, we're all human. We all like to have things now and again that are probably not the best thing for us. And I think we need to acknowledge that and go, yeah, that is who we are. We all probably have our little tendencies, the things that we like to go to. You know, maybe it's stress. I know for me, if there's a lot of stress on in my life and there is at the moment to do with my mum and her health, I tend to seek certain foods out that I know are probably not the best for me. That In that moment, they feel as though there's something I want to consume. And I think we need to be honest about that. What we're not looking for is perfection. When you say diet drinks are probably not that helpful, you know, if you're having the odd one now and again, it's probably going to be fine. But if you're having three or four of them a day, seven days a week, four weeks a month, 12 months a year, you know, there may be some consequences. And I think that nuance is really, really important. You mentioned also about these three beverages, water, tea, and coffee. Now, you didn't mention alcohol. Uh, There wasn't a fourth beverage, even though certain communities around the world who are written about, the Blue Zones, for example, to be long-living, most of those Blue Zones, not all of them, I think, I don't think Loma Linda, uh, the fifth Blue Zone, I don't think they consume alcohol. But the other four, I believe, do consume alcohol. Now, I have some very clear views about alcohol and where that fits in. How do you see alcohol in the context of our overall health and, I guess, in relation to your latest book, around the context of fat loss? Yeah. Well, you know, I get asked this question all the time. Dr. Lee, what do you think about uh, red wine or or what about alcohol? And, you know, oftentimes the reason that someone's asking is either that they have heard that drinking red wine or drinking wine in the blue zones is is has been is touted as being associated with longevity or better health and there are some clinical studies that also show some of these overall correlations of health benefit as well um i oftentimes f- think that people who are asking those questions are looking for a justification or an excuse uh for it so i i'm i'm always trying to understand where the question is actually coming from but i'm a scientist and you know like you you and i are both physicians we have to answer very honestly and the honest answer is is that that alcohol ethanol which is a chemical uh it's a product of fermentation uh it's actually what makes you uh, feel boozy and drunk okay there's no health benefit from it. it's a toxin it's a toxin for virtually every organ in our body. It it kills your brain, kills your liver. And you don't have to drink very much, frankly, of pure ethanol, the pure stuff to knock yourself off. Uh, It is actually a poison. That said, wine and other spirits, again, are part of who we are as humans, part part of our humanity. You know, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, from the time of earliest cultivation, of agriculture, people have actually been cultivating grapes and fermenting them and not making just processed grape juice. They've been making wine. Wine actually uh, has been a revered part of human tradition, uh, religious ceremonies, uh, celebrations. Wines are wine and, and spirits are consumed at funerals, at holidays, celebrating the new year, cultures around the world. But in no case is the actual ethanol something that is healthy for you. It's that this is part of our our human tradition. It's not done very frequently. And like anything else, if done in moderation, it's probably okay. Now, what about the blue zones? What about these Sardinian goat herders who actually um, do drink red wine uh, every night, you know, from the the great Sardinian Cannonel red wine, which, you know, actually is quite a nice wine. Here's the issue. They are doing almost everything else right in their lives. and the, so the alcohol that they're having is offset by uh, all the other yeah. physical activity, low stress, social con- commitment, sense of purpose, uh, other healthy, local, fresh foods that are actually grown and prepared in healthy ways. The absence of ultra processed foods. They're not drinking a lot of diet sodas, diet or otherwise. And so in that sense, 
You know, everything is a check and balance. Our, yeah. our body is like a gigantic calculator. So how much does, if you do everything else right, how much does a glass or two uh, of red wine, of, al- of ethanol uh, do for you? Probably not much harm. And by the way, the fermentation product of, in red wine, if you remove the ethanol, the toxic stuff, all the other polyphenols are actually uh, in the non-alcoholic part of the liquid. So, you know, I think yeah. this nuance part is actually really important, as you brought up. Yeah, there's just so much there. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing your perspective. I think a lot about thresholds when I talk to my patients. There's also a course called Prescribing Lifestyle Medicine that is accredited by the Royal College of GPs that me and a colleague teach to healthcare professionals and doctors all over the world about how to use the principles of lifestyle medicine to personalize care for the individual patients. And we've created all these frameworks to help uh, people do that. And I talk about thresholds a lot on that course and say, look, especially when you're looking at our lifestyle behaviors, it's not always about the one thing. It's about the combination of things. You know, what else is going on? And I completely agree to go to these, you know, the theoretical mythical blue zones in our head. Let's say that goat's herder in Sardinia, low levels of stress, strong community ties, local whole foods, right? Alcohol there is probably being used as a way of bonding and connecting. It's not being used, typically from what I understand, as a way of de-stressing from the chronic overload, the chronic stress. And of course, in the West, you know, we know that stress now is thought to be responsible for 80 to 90% of the conditions that medical doctors see. If you're using alcohol as a way to mitigate stress, I'm not convinced it's going to have the same impact that if you're feeling really chilled and relaxed, you're using half a glass of wine to bond with one of your best mates who you've not seen in a while. I really do believe the impact on the body is going to be somewhat different. Also, speaking to what you just said about uh, tea and coffee, let's say, Tea and coffee are really interesting because we can epidemiologically look at populations. And I think last time you came on the podcast, we spoke a little bit about tea and we'll definitely get to tea because I know you're a huge tea fan and how these long living populations are consuming high amounts of tea and coffee. But also to really get very granular, we can look in the lab and look at the cell and look at the science and reduce it right down and go, yes tea and coffee have certain compounds that are going to be helping us. We can't really say the same for alcohol in the same way. Yes, epidemiologically, these populations are consuming. But then, as you said, yes, there are compounds within the alcohol. But if you look at the pure ethanol, I'm not sure yet we've got any scientific study showing that is good for our cells. Do you know what I mean? So I think on all these levels, we have to take a bit of balance and go, what else is going on in your life? Maybe the amount of alcohol you're currently consuming is not the best thing for you, perhaps. No, I, I totally agree. And, and this idea of bonding is really important because if you're getting together to celebrate an event or mark an event and bringing people together, that social bonding actually is really important. Your gut microbiome, by the way, also responds uh, to the bonding by helping to text message your brain to release social hormones as well. So again, I think that we tend to oversimplify the impact of foods. Nuance, again, is really important. What happens in addition to the food? What's the context in which the food is actually eaten? It's healthier to eat with people than to eat alone. Not only are you more likely to eat less, uh, but you're also uh, connecting uh, with with others as well. And, and oftentimes, uh, people are interested in uh, the uh, the other's sense of purpose, yeah. you know, which you then leave for yourself. All of these factors are there. And by the way, you know, maybe to give a another analogy that I, as we were talking, I was thinking about. We all do things that may not be the best for us occasionally, and that's okay. And I think giving people that acknowledgement of humanity and the occasional going off the reservation uh, is is totally fine. It's like when we drive a car, right? I mean, on the highway, most of us are abide with safety, traffic safety rules, and we drive in safe ways. Every now and then, you got to go into the fast lane and you speed and you go a little bit faster than you should, or maybe a lot faster than you should. But but and that's okay, you know, for the most part. 
But if you got in a fast lane every single day and you put the pedal to the metal and went as fast as you possibly could, guarantee you that that is unlikely to end up in a good way for you as a driver. And so I think that if we think about our lives as sort of a journey on a highway where the behaviors that we actually take, decisions that we make are not dissimilar to, yeah. you know, the decisions we make in, in a car on the road, that might help us understand uh, every now and then you need to get go a little bit faster, maybe even above the speed limit. And that's OK as long as you're not doing it all the time. Yeah. Thank you for that. I want to really dive now into some of the science in your new book, which, you know, the subtitle I think says it all, burn fat, heal your metabolism, live longer. Okay. I think these are three things most of us are pretty keen to have a bit more of in our lives. Now, let's start with fat. So yes, there's a lot of people around the world now who are carrying excess weight. When we talk about losing weight, to get really specific, I think most people are talking about losing excess fat, not necessarily weight. But let's just start off at the beginning, right? Because fat has got a bad rap. We associate fat in our bodies as being toxic. But you quite beautifully make the case that actually fat is helpful. Certainly the right kinds of fat and the right amounts can be very, very helpful and we need it. So let's go back to the start Talk to us about fat and why it's so important for our bodies. Information is not enough to make change in your life. You have to take action. So to help you take action after watching this video, I've created a free nutrition guide for you. This contains the five most important practices I've seen in over two decades of seeing patients. They work for you no matter what your dietary preference. There's a step-by-step -step action plan to help you implement those changes in your life. If you want to receive that free guide right now, just click on the link in the description box below. Yeah. So first of all, I want to acknowledge that excess body fat is something that most of us can recognize instantly when we step out of the shower. I think we've all had this experience. You step out of the shower in the mirror, you're, you're, you're naked and out of the corner of your eye, you see in the mirror a lump or a bump that displeases you, wasn't there before. Immediately, you have this negative feeling that, oh man, I'm gaining weight. I, I've got too much body fat. What's the next thing you do? You step on the scale. The number that comes up may or may not be the number you want to see. And then you start to curse yourself. And I think that as adults, this is a very common kind of reaction to the idea of fat. In fact, one of the things that, that you know, if you go to the grocery store and you walk by the butcher section and you see a rind of fat around um, uh, the piece of meat, it's, it kind of gives you a negative feeling. Mm. And so one of the things that I'm a scientist I sort of wanted to ask myself, uh, as we certainly understand that fat is something that needs to be tamed, uh, uh, in some cases, people clearly, as a doctor, I've told many people that having excess body fat puts them at high risk for chronic conditions like diabetes and heart disease and cancer. And it's in their interest to really try to lose some of that extra body fat, not just weight. You don't want to lose muscle weight. You want to lose body fat. And frankly, not every kind of body fat. It made me as a scientist want to go back to the origin. So this is where I think we really want to begin at the beginning. Okay. First of all, uh, a lot of people don't realize that fat is formed on our body while we're in our mother's womb. And this is some of the origins of it. So when your mom's egg met your dad's sperm, and they fertilized and it turned into a ball of cells that would become the future you. The first, one of the first tissues that get lays down is uh, formed is your circulation because every organ is going to need to have a blood supply. Another uh, tissue that gets laid down very early are your nerves because every organ is going to need instructions through the wiring that nerves provide. And then the third tissue that forms as we develop in the body, you know, in the womb is our body fat. They're called adipose cells. That's the name of the cell that 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 fat is of which fat is composed, and adipose cells or little fat cells wrap around like bubble wrap around um, blood vessels. Now you know the bubble wrap is the, the packing wrap that you can click and pop. All right, they're they're little fat cells. They're tiny. They wrap around our circulation. Now why do they do this? It has to do with what fat ultimately is designed to do after we're born, which is when later we eat food and we have that energy. 
the insulin that we mentioned earlier will draw the energy into our cells, but any extra energy gets stored into the fat. So it makes a lot of sense that fat cells, which form our fuel tanks, just like the fuel tank in your car, is located next to a blood vessel because as we eat food, the nutrients go into our, the energy goes into our bloodstream and we want to store it right in our fuel tank in the same way that when you pull over to the filling station and you want to put petrol in your car, um, you want to have it close by so that the, the nozzle can go into the tank. So that's how we form um, when we're uh, when we're little. Now, fast forward to nine months when we are born and we take our first breath. Think about the the appearance of fat on a baby. A healthy baby is a chubby baby. Round tummy, round cheeks, arms and legs that look like those balloons in the circus that the clown twists to make a poodle, right? A little circus animal. A fat baby, a chubby baby is a happy baby. In fact, that's how we know. It brings a smile to our faces. And in fact, if you saw, if we saw a baby that was thin with chiseled cheeks like a runway model, thin arms and long, thin thighs, we'd be freaked out and we'd say, there's something seriously wrong with this infant, right? And we'd be completely correct. And so the fact is that body fat, even as we are young, is something that is part of who we are. It serves a very important role. And that sets up for asking. Uh, and by the way, because it's formed in a womb, I always tell people semi-jokingly, you had body fat before you had a face you could stuff with food. All right. So, th- So that's why we need to kind of dissociate this idea of like, eating too much and gobbling up and then having fat grow, the fat actually plays a very, very important healthy role. So it turns out there's at least four functions of fat that we didn't previously, we don't appreciate, and we didn't previously appreciate, we don't appreciate it enough. Number one, fat is actually a cushion, not just a, not just a layer of insulation like blubber, but in fact, it's a cushion. It's in our bodies to cushion our organs. If we, because we didn't have it, if we tripped on a rug and fell on the ground, Uh, our organs might burst because it doesn't have enough cushioning. So thank goodness we actually have fat as a healthy cushion. But the second thing that fat uh, actually does that's quite remarkable is our fat is an endocrine organ for our metabolism. Endocrine organ is an organ that secretes hormones, like your thyroid, like your pancreas, like your adrenal glands, like your testicles, like your ovaries, like your pituitary gland. And you say, wait a minute, are you saying fat is an organ? Absolutely. In fact, it's the largest endocrine hormone secreting organ in our body. And the hormones that fat secretes, there's at least 15 of them. I just want to like let people know these, the hormones that your normal healthy body fat secretes allows you to stay alive and gives you the energy to just be who you are and to function to get from place to place and do ordinary things. And three of the hormones that people need to know. Number one, there's a hormone called leptin. Leptin is sometimes known as a satiety hormone, meaning it makes you feel full. But I prefer to have people understand, um, and this is how I understand it as a scientist, it's more of a volume switch. You turn it up, you turn it down, okay? When leptin is up, you don't want to eat as much, volume's up. When leptin is down, um, you want to eat some more. But, you know, your body fine-tunes that switch. It's not, a, it's not a light switch, an on and off switch. It's more of a volume switch. Okay, so that's something that healthy fat makes in order to, to help us geared towards getting going to the fuel tank, eating food so we can load up our body tank with fuel so our metabolism can go to work. Another hormone is called adiponectin. Adiponectin um, is a fat-made hormone. That's why it's called adiponectin because it's made by adipose cells. A lot of people don't know this, but if I went to a patient and I asked for a vial of blood and I sent it to the hospital lab for measuring all the possible organs out there, the results would come back and many people would be surprised that their normal healthy levels of adiponectin, this fat derived hormone is a thousand times higher than other hormones in your body, higher than cortisol, higher than thyroid hormone. And the question is, why is it so high? Why is this fat hormone the the highest level of hormone in your body? It's because adiponectin helps insulin draw in energy from the food we eat. A diponectin from fat works with insulin from our pancreas. Two endocrine organs work together so that when we eat food and we have energy, it can draw the energy efficiently into our cells. The more adiponectin we make, the more energy or the more efficiently we draw the energy in. This is how important our fat is. It's making a diponectin so our insulin will actually work. Insulin sensitivity being very, very important. Ironically, um, you're saying fat, Dr. Lee, helps insulin sensitivity. 
Absolutely. The right amount of fat is critical for our insulin to actually work. Now, you have too much of it or too little of it, you got a problem. Now, the other hormone is called resistin. And if adiponectin is the gas pedal to allow us to absorb energy more efficiently, resistin is the brake. So, well, not so fast. Maybe slow down just a little bit, right? So just like I remember driving a car, the accelerator and the brake, they work together. You, you, you don't want to have only the accelerator. That'd be a problem. Or only the brake. You wouldn't go anywhere. And so these are three fat hormones that are really important. Leptin, adiponectin, and resistin, all without worrying about obesity or diabetes. In fact, you need these things to function properly. So this is the endocrine uh, function. The third function that is vital, actually, is that our fat uh, uh, is the fuel tank. We talked about this earlier, but as adults, when we eat food and we're uh, powering in our, in our insulin and adiponectin is just helping that energy into our body so we can go to the next meeting or, or, or make the bed or, you know, go out grocery shopping or go to a par- birthday party. Um, anything extra than what we need, our body stores that, that extra energy into our fat cells. Now, every fat cell can is, is pliable. It's kind of like a balloon. You can actually put a lot of fat into it. It, uh, uh, lipogenesis is what it's called, creating fat cells that, for triglycerides. You can expand a fat with this fuel, load up the fuel tank, so it's 100 times larger than where it started out. So unlike a car's fuel tank, which is fixed and made out of metal, um, our fat fuel tanks actually can expand, and you can expand it 100 times. And if you continue to eat uh, and you have extra energy, well, your body will just tap into another fat cell and blow that up 100 times. Oh, still more food? Well, let's just go to another fuel cell and, and blow that up. Oh, you still uh, still eating? Oh, still overeating? Well, now we've kind of run out of fat cells. Let's go to our stem cells and make a brand new fat cell and blow that up. And again and again and again, the more we overeat, the more we've got to load up on this fuel. And very simply, if you think about the food we eat and the, and the energy that we store that our metabolism actually uses to drive our body, this makes overeating and the growth of fat completely understandable. So fat is, a, is our fuel tank, but if we over, overload our fuel tank, it'll actually be a problem. Now, by the way, this fuel tank analogy makes is very important because if we actually had a car and we pulled over to the, and when we noticed that the fuel tank was low, the gauge was low, we pull over to the filling station, we load up our fuel tank. Uh, most of the time, the, there's a clicker at the end of the fuel gauge that will actually, when the tank is full, it'll click and it'll stop filling up the tank. Imagine if you didn't have this automatic stop of the fuel, fuel tank fills up, oops, it's broken, and you're still loading fuel. And what's going to happen? The fuel is going to, petrol is going to come out of the tank, run down the side of the car, around the tires, cool around your legs. And now you're going to be standing in this dangerous, toxic, flammable substance of too much fuel. Now, in our body, our body is not wired with a clicker, so we can keep eating. We can keep flowing up our, filling up our fuel tank and fill, filling up our fat. And in fact, what happens, just like in a car that's a fuel tanks overflowing, we can have fat leak out of our fat cells when we have too much. And that fat accumulates in our liver and it is lipotoxic. Lipo meaning fat, toxic. Well, it's obvious what that means. We can actually poison our liver. And one of the biggest epidemics right now is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Fatty liver meaning overloaded fuel spilling off, you know, and, and killing our liver. This is a really, this is a silent epidemic that's actually going on that's attached directly to the behavior uh, of of overeating in an era of abundance. So that's another, but the, but the fuel tank part, normal healthy fuel tank is very important. And the final component of what fat does, the fourth surprise that most people don't think about. So before you kind of beat up your fat, think about these incredibly important functions is that our fat acts as a space heater. It can actually create heat. It's called thermogenesis and not just any fat, but called brown fat. Now we've got two colors of fat in our body white fat and brown fat. White fat is wiggly and jiggly. It's the stuff under the arm, under the chin. It's the muffin top that people don't want to have. It's in your thighs and your butt. White fat, subcutaneous, under the skin fat is the stuff most people want to get rid of. White fat is also visceral fat. Visceral fat is packed inside the tube of your body. When you grow visceral fat, you actually expand the tube of your body because it's like stuffing a suitcase you need a bigger suitcase. It's expanding. It's like putting extra, folding like a, a jacket, a winter jacket into your suitcase. 
It's going to not really close. It's going to really expand and be stuffed. That's visceral fat. That's white fat. Again, wiggly, jiggly, lumpy, bumpy. And when it's too much, it's dangerous. Brown fat is completely different than that. And this is actually something that a lot of people don't appreciate. Brown fat is paper thin, wafer thin. And it's not close to the skin, so you can't see it. It is close to the bone. And it's located around the side of our neck, under our breastbone, under our arms, a little bit in our belly, behind our shoulder, and between our shoulder blades. And this brown fat acts like a uh, space heater. Actually, I, another analogy is it acts like the burner on our gas range, our mm. gas stove in the kitchen. You click it on, it goes whoosh, and you get this flame. And to burn that flame so you can heat up your water or heat up your soup or cook your stew, that fuel to that flame has to come from someplace. And what brown fat does is it draws that fuel, that energy from your harmful white fat, that overloaded fat, the fuel cells. So this is a strange but wonderful system where brown fat, good fat can burn down white fat, harmful fat in your body. So those four aspects of fat, we haven't even talked about obesity or being overweight or diabetes or chronic disease. These functions of being the cushion, creating hormones, uh, being the fuel tank, and actually being able to uh, light up and create heat. This is the miracle of yeah. normal, healthy fat. Yeah, I mean, that's brilliant. So insightful. And I guess in many ways, just helps to change our relationship with the word fats because it has mm. become very toxic and you know we can, we can go into some of the consequences of that so one of the things that i see which i think is a little bit worrying actually is you can almost not talk about weight loss anymore when you're talking about health certainly in the uk i don't know what it's like in america it's very much messaging now that let's just focus on health let's just focus on health and well-being let's not talk about weight loss. And I, I understand that. I understand where it comes from. Well, one of the reasons is because there's been a lot of fat shaming in culture for many years, which is incredibly toxic, is incredibly problematic. But again, with many things, we, we, we go to these extremes and there's a bit of nuance there. And as a medical doctor, I have to be able to talk about the consequences of excess fat on our bodies. You know, my fourth book, uh, Dr. Lee was called Feel Great, Lose Weight. It was a, again, like yours, it was a an anti-diet book. It was a more holistic, rounded, sustainable approach to people who want to lose excess weight. And I tell you, and I don't know if you've had this yet or not, Dr. Lee, but I had a, you know, some of my followers were like, oh, wrong, and I love everything you've done. I love your first three books, but really shocked that you released a diet book. I'm interested as to whether you've experienced any of that yet or not. I certainly hope not. But there's a wider point here, which I think you just spoke to, that fat is not per se bad. It's when the fat becomes too much and goes into the wrong compartments when it becomes problematic. So could you just speak to that a little bit, please? Yeah. So look, um, I think it's horrible to have body shaming. I think that it's uh, it um, and the media, of course, over decades yeah. have created this unrealistic idealism uh, about the perfect body shape that uh, actually whips people into a frenzy, frankly, uh, when it comes to uh, trying to do weight loss. So I, I sort of think about um, something more uh, positive and, 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 and the word that I use is actually body positivity. We want our, we want to be very positive about the things in our body and our body. If you, if you recognize, you know, it has been said that the body's a temple. And what I would say is that, you know, the body's hardwired. It's really remarkable. You don't have superfoods. You really have a super body. The body is hardwired to do a lot of remarkable things. And fat really needs to be moved from this category of something we don't want. Okay. And it's unpleasant. It's just something that's actually really powerful to help us attain and maintain our health. Okay. But like anything else, it's it's about balance. Anything that's excess in our body is generally not very healthy for us. And so fat can be thought of as absolutely a healthy tissue that we need to have enough. I want to talk about body size for one second before talking about what happens when fat goes in excess and creates chaos. But, you know, this idea about fat and body size, it's nuanced again. You know, one of the things that I write about in my book that I use to reframe my own thinking about body size 
is that if you look at some of the fittest people in the world, people who are physically fit, they have different body sizes and they could be at the peak of their fitness with different body sizes. And the best example are Olympians, Olympic athletes. Think about that. You've got the tiny gymnast, you've got the lanky marathoner, and you've got the shot putter and the weightlifter. These are all people with very, very different body sizes that are attuned mm. to what they do best, personalized to what they do best. And they're the fittest they're probably ever going to be there in their entire lives. And it's and we celebrate that. And I think that that's something that we mm. can learn to do is to recognize that there is a champion that can be at any different size. And so that we don't actually try to think there's only one uh, iconic size that actually is perfect for fitness. Let's talk about fitness. Um, the other thing that, you know, in, in boxing, in American boxing, um, you know, there are 14 different weight classes. Heavyweight, you know, 250 people pounds and above, but also featherweight and ultra featherweight. I mean, these are people that are light. They're like a, just over a hundred pounds. And again, if you like look at this competition of people who are boxing with at these different weight classes, there is a world champion in at every weight class. And I think that if we sort of recast this idea that body yeah. size and body fat are different, fitness and body size are different. Just look at the Olympics and look at and look at other sports. Uh, I, I think it's just helpful to reframe yeah. our thinking. Can I just respond to that? I think that's such a beautiful yeah. point. And I think, Dr. Lee, there's also potentially the issue of race here, where certain cultures, certain ethnicities have different body sizes and presumably carry different amounts of fat in certain ways. Yet, we seem to try and narrow everyone down to the same size and the same level. So I think that's an important thing as well. But, but then the wider point, Dr. Lee, is how can someone who is reading your book or, or watching this or, or listening to this podcast right now, how can they determine if they've got the right level of fat for them to give all the benefits you've so beautifully outlined or whether now the amount of fat they've got, the location of the fat is now starting to become problematic for them. Is there an easy way for them to do that? Yeah, so the, the answer really is uh, we're beginning to find more sophisticated ways to measure this. You asked two things. Number one, you know, uh, uh, how do they know uh, how much fat is, is healthy versus unhealthy uh, and how do you measure it? And, and also, where is it located? That's also quite important. So we know, um, uh, and before I can actually come to, to both of those points, let me just say one thing. Remember we talked about those four healthy uh, fat functions, the cushion, the hormone releasing of hormones, the endocrine function, the fuel tank function, and the, uh, and the space heater function. Look, when you actually overeat and grow too much body fat, and when your metabolism is, is upset, well, you start to grow excess body fat, no matter where it is, okay? What happens is that excess body fat, as it accumulates, getting larger and larger and larger, this mound of fat that accumulates too quickly can do a couple of things. Number one, it out rapidly outgrows its blood supply because fat's an organ, it needs its blood supply. And when it outgrows its blood supply, because it's expanding so fast, think about like fat being like a loaf of bread you put in the oven, it's just blowing up or a souffle blowing up really quickly. The center part of it doesn't have enough blood vessels. It can't get enough circulation. And what happens, it's called hypoxia. Uh, hypoxia meaning not getting enough oxygen in rapidly expanding fat tissue. Hypoxia in tissues, in human tissues, winds up becoming inflammatory. Okay. So in addition to actually leaking that fat, the fat out of the fuel tanks, as I described, expanding fat becomes inflammatory. And inflammation pretty much screws up the hormonal function, when you script the hormonal function with ischemic or hypoxic fat that's inflammatory, in addition to the leaking of the fuel, which is a disaster, kind of a environmental disaster inside your body, what does it do to the hormonal function? Well, your leptin goes, I don't know, it's pretty, it's pretty messed up in here. I don't know if we're hungry or not so hungry. I don't know what to do. A diponectin? Well, I don't know. Should we make more diponectin to be more efficient or should we make less? I, mm. I, I can't, I can't keep my, Keep track of this. And resistant, should we slow down or speed up? I don't know. And so when you actually grow excess fat and it starts to leak and has it becomes toxic and winds up also becoming inflammatory, we disrupt all of these functions that normally help keep us healthy. And it, you sort of 
knock it off kilter. Where is this? Where in the body is this the worst? Okay. The worst place for this uh, chaos, this riot to happen within our fat that disrupts the normal healthy function is actually within a tube of our body, right? So think of our body, our, our, our bellies, especially kind of like a sausage casing, right? So the, and, and our, and our, and we know that when we, we, when we wear a belt, all right, we're wearing the belt around the sausage casing. Um, when we actually grow excess visceral fat, remember I told you it's the lumpy, bumpy fat that grows inside the tube of your body. When we grow it, this kind of fat is like a glove, like a thick glove, uh, like a ski glove that um, when it's expanding, that wraps around and strangles your organs. It can grow enormously inside the tube of your body. And I give an example of this, like if you were to try to ship some delicate champagne glasses uh, over uh, overnight, you know, with a Federal Express or some overnight courier service, and you go to the uh, the post and they and basically say, can you hand me a, a box for these glasses? They'll give you a small, thin box, and then you'll you'll get packing peanuts. And you can just lightly pour packing peanuts in there so you have just enough and close it and mail it off. Or you could be very aggressive and stuff it with an mm-hmm. entire bag of packing peanuts, more than you need. And you're really, really packing it in and you're forcing the lid shut and you tape it shut. The box still looks pretty thin, but inside that, that those peanuts are really compressing. There's way too many peanuts in there. Okay. Pressing against those glasses. That's what visceral fat can do to your organs. And now you start making this expansion leaking inflammatory system. You can kind of see why this might be bad. Now, what's the simplest way we can tell you're gaining visceral fat? Well, it's actually your belt size. So the simplest way is if your pants start getting a little tight and you have to unloosen your belt by one uh, one hole, you're probably growing visceral fat. Uh, you know, the proverbial beer gut um, uh, is not the muffin top. It's literally you're expanding uh, the, the casing. The good news is that actually, and I read about in my book, we can actually shrink that visceral fat. There are ways that we can actually utilize our metabolism and foods to be able to shrink that visceral fat so we have less of those peanuts packing our in the tube inside our body. So location does matter. Uh, while we might not enjoy seeing uh, fat under our arm or under our chin, that's not the most harmful part. The most harmful part is that visceral fat that's inside. So now you ask, well, so how much fat is too much and how much is about the right amount? Well, this is actually another interesting fact that I write about. You know, uh, what percent body fat is considered healthy? I think it depends on your body size. And there's no one number that fits for everyone. It's kind of like clothing, right? I mean, you might be small, medium, and large. You you go to the store, you're going to look in the rack to look for what size works for you to fit your body type, all right? And so I think that's really important. Again, the nuance of actually personalization is different. But in general, by percent, we're really talking about 10 to 15% is probably you know, uh, okay, probably a good amount, less than 5%. You know, some some uh, bodybuilders will really, really skinny down their body weight. And so they have less than 5% fat, 2% fat. When you do that, the reason that, that bodybuilders do it, is, man, you see every sinew in your body. You've like pretty much, you've melted away all the the the, the fat in your body. All your, the sinews actually stick out of your muscle. It looks beautiful for competition for the judges, but that's not healthy. And in fact, studies have shown that people who have really, really low body fat, radically underweight, they actually have higher mortality than people actually have too much weight as well. So again, this is about balance. It's about being in that Goldilocks zone of, of healthy amounts, not too much, not too little, but just right. I think this point about visceral fat is really, really key because many of us these days are carrying excess fat. I think that's just a reality that we may not want to acknowledge, we may not want to accept, but I think many of us are. And it doesn't always show up with us being overtly overweight. There's, of course, a condition called skinny fat, whereby on the outside, people look fine. You would, you know, many people will say, oh, that person can eat whatever they want. They can have cakes and pastries and drink what they want, yet they're not putting on weight. Now, certainly, cosmetically, from the outside, it may not appear that there's a problem, but that doesn't mean that internally there's no problem. And I think you either wrote about this, or I think you said in a recent interview I watched, 
The fat you want to fight, you can't necessarily see. That's right. I mean, it's it's the the stuff you see is subcutaneous, but the but the dangerous stuff is invisible because it's actually packed inside the tube of your body. Uh, so you know, I think we need to also shift our focus. One of the things that I, I try to do in my book is to explain the sci- the new science of the metabolism and the new science of the body fat, so that we can appreciate just how important fat actually is for our health. This isn't about body shame. It's very, very much about body, body positivity and what we're discovering about what our fat does. But you know, too much of the wrong kind of fat in the wrong place can be extraordinarily dangerous. And we definitely want to be uh, wary of that. By the way, one of the things that I found so interesting when I was researching my book is where, where, you know, where does visceral fat accumulate? What's one of the first places that visceral fat accumulates when you gain extra harmful body fat? Do you, um, I don't know if, if you read this part, but, um, it turns out that even skinny people, regardless of your body size, but including skinny people, when you grow body fat, where, where do you think the first place it goes? Take a guess. You'd think your stomach, I guess, or around your waist. I think that's what most people that's would right. think. And the reason we, most people think that is because that's what we can see, right? We see that in a mirror. So it's exactly the logical answer, but that's not the case. The first place when we start gaining excess visceral fat, harmful fat, is our tongue. Wow. Our tongue actually can get fat. And here's the thing that's really cool. Even as a medical doctor, I didn't realize this, and I did a deep dive into it. So, um, I don't know if you remember from med school, uh, uh, Ranga, but like we had to dissect all the tissues in the body, right, to learn yeah. what's inside it, so we can appreciate it as as doctors and living people what what the what the uh, cadavers actually would teach us. Well, I learned that more recent research has looked at the anatomy of the human tongue, which is about the size and weight of a bar of soap, and found that the tongue is composed of three different sections. The first section, the tip of the tongue, is like a circus acrobat. It can actually do all kinds of fancy feats. The middle of the tongue is very muscular because it moves food around through different parts of our mouth. It needs to be really strong. But the back of our tongue, the the last third of our tongue, is actually very fatty. It's kind of a cushion. Uh, It's in the back of our it's back at the back of our mouth, uh, just against our throat, and it's filled with visceral fat. In fact, when you slice it open, it's marbled like a ribeye steak it's actually like a roast very ribbed with uh, it's got lots and lots of marbling of visceral fat so when we start gaining visceral fat one of the first places it starts to accumulate is in the back of our tongue now how do we know this studies have been done in sweden of 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 skinny people uh women who actually started to gain fat um and 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 it started first in their tongue and they were able to measure this with mri and uh coincidentally it was found that their bed partners would often say, hey, you know what? You're starting to snore. Yeah. And they would say, oh, interestingly, I'm starting to gain weight too. And think about what happens when you're sleeping, you're relaxed and your tongue, your fat tongue is also relaxed and it sags and it blocks your airways. Yeah. So all of a sudden you snort, you have sleep apnea and you start to snore. And so this is one of the interesting things. Again, this idea that the kind of fat that we want to tame grows first in locations that we can't see very easily, but are, it's deep inside our body. The re, you know, look, I'm all for cause, uh, for, for cosmetics of you. And, and I don't have a problem with vanity. If you want to look better because you want to shape your body in a way that's pleasing to you, please do. I don't have a problem with that. But what I do think is that people go to extremes to, and focus only on that. And they ignore what's really important which is this visceral fat inside our body that you can't see. Yeah. What you said about the tongue is fascinating because, you know, we're looking for early warning signs, aren't we? Things that we can pick up before things get really, really harmful. And of course, we both know that erectile dysfunction for men is really important early warning sign because if you're having, depending on the cause of it, of course, if there's a problem with the blood vessel in your genitalia and it's showing up, well, there's very likely to be a problem also with the blood vessels in your heart. So it's an early warning sign, right? We know that as doctors, if that comes up, we need to be thinking about the heart as well. But I think what you just said about snoring is a, is another beautiful early warning sign. If 
you think you're okay with your weight, hasn't been flagged as a major concern to you, but you have started to snore and you previously weren't, hey, maybe you want to just check it out, maybe see a doctor, maybe to see what might be going on. It's an, it's another simple, free, non-invasive way to get an indication. But also, Dr. Lee, this really fits with um, a lot of things I've seen over two decades of practice now, which is if people have got uh, snoring, even if they've got early obstructive sleep apnea, like what I found is if I can drastically help them improve their health, improve their diet. Yes, often it's because they want to lose weight. But yes, they lose weight. But often their sleep apnea gets better. Often they stop snoring as well. I know in some extreme cases, it's not enough. But it really speaks to this idea that when you've come on the show before you've spoken about in your last book, and also in this book, the body is connected. It's a system. You change one thing in one area, it affects something else in another area. Yeah, no, that's absolutely co completely correct. And by the way, some of those improvements that you were just describing, uh, sort of overall improvements, one of the first things that we can do about that to appreciate about our body fat is that in the same way that we can actually grow fat by over by continuously overfeeding and filling up our tanks and requiring more tanks, we can also consume the tanks and we can actually shrink it down as well. And so this idea, and this is especially true of the visceral fat, we can actually reduce the amount of visceral fat in our body. This is actually something that we have agency over. In fact, I will tell you that there's no real drug there's no pharmaceutical that you or I could write to specifically shrink down visceral fat, but there are foods that can actually achieve that, which is really quite remarkable. And so the, the, the point is that this is, this is the kind of healthcare that we do at home outside of the doctor's office that empowers us to make good decisions. And especially when the foods that can actually do this fit within the realm of culinary traditions from healthy uh, eating patterns from around the world that people find delicious. That's to me can give you joy and better align, you know, all the science that we've been talking about with really behavior changes that you can look forward to. You know, one of the things that I think that um, is, is so important that small changes don't have to be unpleasant changes. Yeah. Even big changes don't be pleasant. They can actually give you joy. I always say it's time to rediscover the joy in our life, especially what we've gone through over the last few years and even thinking about today, the present day and all the, kind of ominous things that are on the horizon, it causes a huge amount of stress. Um, our food and how, what we eat and how we eat and with whom we eat can all be small, subtle, but powerful things that can help us not only gain overall health, but also lose some of the weight and the dangerous visceral fat along the way. Look, we've, we've covered a lot of science. There was plenty more I wanted to talk about, but I really do think we should get into what you're just talking about now, which is what are some of these foods, right? So we started off the conversation, Dr. Lee, talking about some foods that people think are health promoting, but actually if consumed too often uh, for too long a period of time, actually are not health promoting. We then spoke about the relationship between gut health and the fat in our bodies we then were talking about the science of fat. You beautifully explained how fat actually is an organ and we need to think about it. It's not all bad, but if we get too much in the wrong places, it starts to become problematic. And we could go down that rabbit hole for longer for sure, but you are one of the leading experts in the world, I think, researching and writing about food as medicine. So I really want to talk about what are some of these foods that can burn off that fat for us. And there was a very interesting paragraph, provocative paragraph, I would say, in your introduction that I really liked. And if you don't mind, I was just going to read it out to you just to sort Please. of set up this part of the conversation. Certain foods can stop fat cells from expanding. Other foods cause bad fat cells to become good fat cells. Still, other foods can even redirect a fat stem cell so it can't create more dangerous fat. Some foods even crank up your brown fat space heater. And I could go on, but essentially, I'm not sure that is common knowledge, that actually the foods you can eat, specific foods, can actually go in and target fat. So 
We're all waiting. What are some of these foods that we can start bringing into our diet to do all these magical things? All right. I want to tell you a little background story of how I got into this area of research to begin with. Um, I wrote about foods in my first book that activate your health defenses, your circulation, angiogenesis, stem cells, your microbiome, your DNA defenses, as well as your immune system that also lowers inflammation. And one of the things, and I get, and I wrote actually about 300 plus foods in that book, uh, and, and I really loved them. The book became very popular, and one, of, and as it became more and more popular, one of the things in the back of my mind uh, that I was a little um, uh, afraid to hear, actually, I was worried about, is whether or not people would be writing me to say, Dr. Lee, you wrote about so many tasty foods. I'm eating so much that I'm actually starting to become, uh, I'm, I'm gaining too much weight and I'm becoming obese. Like that as a physician, as you described as well, I'm in the same page as you. Like I have a responsibility to actually make sure that people use foods and respect foods in a way that um, is, is within a normal physiological balance. And so I was a little afraid of this, but you know what happened? I would get emails from people who are thanking me for feeling better, more energy coming off medications, you know, just being more empowered in general. Um, but then I started to start, started to receive the first signs that in fact, that quite the opposite of what I was hearing, I was, I was afraid of was coming true. People were saying, you know, Dr. Lee, in addition to all these other good things that you write about, I'm starting to actually lose weight in a way that I haven't been able to lose before. First time I sort of thought, you know, somebody's just, overly kind. But then I started to hear it over and over and over again. And I thought, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. I'm a scientist, so I'm, I'm really attuned when I observe something that doesn't fit with the obvious paradigm. What? Eating food causes you to lose weight? How could that be? Eating foods you enjoy, eating more foods you enjoy cause you to lose weight. That didn't compute for me. And so I had already been studying metabolism in my own research. And so I started to probe into this. Could it be that in many foods, there are bioactive certain substances that actually target fat and cause the behavior of the fat in your body to do something completely different than you would have thought, which is just to get bigger and accumulate? Maybe there is some hidden mechanism within nature that, that is just lying for, hidden in plain sight that we need to know about. And that's really kind of the beating heart of this book, which is not only is there a new science of the metabolism, but in fact, is within the realm of food as medicine, there's this new discovery that the bioactives that are present, that Mother Nature is laced into our foods, can activate the healthy fat to reshape itself, not grow so big, redirect itself so we're creating more beneficial fat than harmful fat um, uh, and, and literally get rid of visceral fat. And as I dove into this deeper and deeper, the discoveries were getting more and more exciting to me because not only was the lab research there showing, identifying what these compounds are, they could be the catechins in tea. They could be the elagic acid in strawberries uh, and in chestnuts. They could actually be the sulforaphanes in brassica, the bro broccoli in bok choy and gylan or, or turmeric. Or it could actually, um, uh, their clinical studies were also being done to show that eating these foods specifically uh, could actually shrink your waistline, your waist circumference, making your body tube a little bit smaller because it is knocking down the visceral fat. Weight loss is sort of, one overall weight loss is sort of a side effect, as you pointed out, to actually right-sizing your body in ways that eating foods can actually generate. And so, what I did, I spent about two years cataloging these foods. I spent about 10 years doing the metabolism research, but two years really cataloging these foods. And I finally write about them again as, as if, as if I were taking the reader into my grocery cart and pushing them around and telling them what to actually put into the cart from section to section in the grocery store. Yeah. It's, it's really an incredible read. Now, a couple of things there. You've, you've mentioned brown fats during this conversation about, you know, brown fat being different from white fat, and we actually want brown fat, and it has a lot of properties that can help us lose weight, lose the excess fat on our bodies that many of us are trying to do. Now, a few months ago, I had Dr. Susanna Soberg on this podcast, and she's done a lot of research into cold immersion and what happens when you spend periods of time in cold water, in cold showers, in cold plunges, 
and what that does to brown fat. But immersing yourself in cold water to increase the amount of brown fat in your body is frankly something that a lot of people are not going to do, right? <laughs> Nor do I think everyone should do cold water immersion, having said that. I think it's going to be very, very individual who benefits from something like that. But you are beautifully making the case in your book that you don't need to actually do that. There are certain foods that will do that for you. So help us unpick that and help us understand what some of these foods might be and how they're able to do this. Okay, this is where my background in biotechnology and looking at the mechanisms, like what is the domino effect of of, of a trigger to the a beneficial effect would be in understanding the brown fat. It turns out that cold immersion, uh, uh, eating foods, uh, uh, and there's a few pharmaceuticals that have been tested uh, can actually activate brown fat and largely in the same way. So let me, uh, let's, I just want to make one point to say brown fat was originally discovered in animals that are subjected to the cold, hence uh, you may have talked about this before. Um, it was discovered actually in hibernating animals plucked out of their burrow uh, in in the the winter time. It's the alpine marmot actually in Europe where they discovered this little brown mass, and it really was the space heater. It actually created heat for the animal and it, to to fuel up that engine to create heat. It was drawing down on the fuel that it accumulated by stuffing its cheeks uh, uh, as it was preparing for hibernation. So. This is an evolutionary process that has been conserved, meaning that it's actually passed on to humans. But for humans, we didn't really think that, you know, because we are born in warm hospital rooms or in incubators, we our homes have thermostats. We don't hibernate. We don't. We're not born in caves anymore, um, cold caves. But you know, it's a vestigial kind of thing. It turns out not to be. It turns out that brown fat is actually an incredibly important thing. But here's how it works. Cold temperature, and you've talked, I'm sure you've talked about this, um, causes a shock to the body that releases uh, epinephrine and, and norepinephrine, these hormones that actually are produced by our brains and they course through our nerves and they uh, turn on, they trigger uh, brown fat and, and really start the engine of the brown fat. Literally like the clicker on your gas range in your oven to start to before you put boil some water, whoosh. All right. And so cold will actually do that. It turns out that the one of the receptors is called the beta-3 adrenergic receptor. Beta-3 adrenergic receptor is a receptor for adrenaline, which is a shock hormone, a stress hormone, a fight or flight hormone. Uh, so brown fat actually lights up when you actually have a shock to your system, like a cold plunge. For those who want to do it, go for it because it's it that's actually how it works. It turns out that there's a bladder medicine, bladder spasm medicine called Mirabegron, because that also does the same thing because the beta adrenergic receptor can actually be found on your bladder, all over your bladder as mm -hmm. well. And in the bladder, it does something different than your brown fat. It actually helps your bladder contract, which you need to contract your bladder to pee. All right. But some people have a spasmodic bladder. It's contracting all the time. You, know, you get leakage and all this other unpleasant stuff. And so there have been medicines that have been discovered to actually hit the beta adrenergic receptor in your bladder to calm the bladder down. It, it hits the beta adrenergic receptor. Interestingly, researchers at the U.S. National Institutes of Health have studied that bladder medicine uh, to see if they can target brown fat. And when they do, it, boom, it lights up the brown fat beautifully. And I, and I show pictures of yeah. this. I've got permission from the researchers to show how this, this mechanism can light up brown fat. Now, I don't recommend anybody to use medicines to light up their brown fat because the doses of the medicines that were tested were way higher than you, you would normally use uh, for, for bladder spasm. So don't do that. But that's a setup to say, well, what else can light up brown fat by with the beta adrenergic receptor? Well, it turns out it's not just the beta adrenergic receptor, but once you click that, once you tip that switch, after that, the next uh, dot that gets checked um, in this uh, cascade is something called uncoupling protein one, UCP one. And that uh, that trigger lives on the mitoc mitochondria, uh, which is a, a little organ in your cells, especially in your brown fat, that is packed. Our, our brown fat is packed with mit mitochondria. These little um, sub-organs in our cells, the mitochondria is the, is the fuel cell. I remember when I was in medical school and I had to memorize everything. I, I, I thought of it as 
mitochondria because it's small but mighty. <laughs> it actually burns fuel, creates a lot of energy. It actually processes, creates ATP, burns ATP to create energy. Well, it turns out mitochondria have a lot of iron in it naturally. Iron, when it's oxidized, is naturally brown. Lots of mitochondria, lots of iron, lots of oxidation. And guess what? That's why brown fat is brown. So for just for people wondering, you know, why is brown fat brown? That's the reason. It's packed with this mighty chondria, mitochondria that is actually a fuel cell. So anything that can activate the beta adrenergic receptor, anything that can actually turn on uncoupling protein one, anything that can activate the mitochondria will turn on your space heater. And this is where foods actually come in because beyond the cold, beyond the bladder spasm drugs is a whole uh, a collection of foods, produce, dried, canned, jarred foods, seafoods, and beverages that can actually turn on one or more of these processes. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible because I, I, I wonder here on this, right? Some of the foods that I know are, I think chili peppers uh, and chili in general are one of these specific foods that target brown fats. Is that right? Can yeah. you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Well, listen, I, I want to I show you. So this is a chili pepper. It's a dried chili pepper. And, you know, you might see this dried and sold in a grocery store. You might use it to cook different types of dishes, whether it's a East Asian dish or a South American dish or an Italian or Spanish dish. A lot of people like chili peppers. And by the way, here's another example of chili. This is what you put on your pizza, right? So chili flakes. Yeah. So lots of chilies come in a lot of different forms that we actually cook with. It turns out that inside chili pepper is something called capsaicin. Capsaicin, it gives us the burn, that zing, the fire in our mouth. Uh, and it actually, and the reason it, it does it is because we have receptors in our tongue, taste receptors uh, for capsaicin. They're called capsaicin receptors. So in addition to sweet, sour, salty, we you know, we can actually, we can activate, we can feel the, the zing. Uh, the, the receptor, just for people who are interested, because I know some people who watch your podcast are, you know, really into the details. It's called the, um, trip V1, um, receptor and capsaicins tackle the trip V, turn on the trip V1. And then it's on, on your tongue. You feel the burn. All right. And what happens is that that receptor text messages your brain and, and two, and your brain releases two different kinds of hormones. One is endorphins. Endorphins make you feel good, which is why some people are in love with eating hot, spicy food. You've heard about that, right? I yeah. can't wait till I get some hot, spicy food. For those people, they have they 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 have their their reaction to, to this endorphin from spices caused by this receptor for the capsaicin binding receptor is one of pleasure. All right. Now, the other hormone that your brain releases is norepinephrine. Norepinephrine actually is released from your brain and it goes down your nerves. And I, and this is what I tell you next time you eat something really spicy. If you, if you, if this is, if you're inclined to do this, do it in a quiet room and close your eyes and just feel your body. You, you, you'll feel the burn. You'll literally feel your brain activated. You'll feel it. I, I kid you not. And then you'll feel a rush of nerves being activated down your neck. Those nerves down your neck light up your brown fat and it'll turn on your brown fat. So uh, no, the norepinephrine from your brain from chili peppers actually turns on that 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 hormone that goes down your neck, activates a beta-3 adrenergic receptor in your brown fat. That turns on the UCP1, turns on the mitochondria and starts the space heater function. You can actually feel that. And by the way, the nor noradrenaline that forms... That's also why people get sweaty and red and flushed when they're eating hot food as well. So this is just another dimension uh, of how foods that we eat uh, can actually activate this. And so that's what we're, that's what one of the things that you alluded to earlier. Uh, I've been doing the research to figure out what exact substance in a food, what's in a caper, what's actually in green tea, what's in coffee, what's in a pear that can, uh, what's in a bean that can actually light up our fat, our, not only our brown fat, but it can also change and shape shift our white fat in order to be able to burn down and, and slim down the harmful fat so we can be more physiologically fit. Yeah, fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I love the way you walked us through that. I'm definitely going to try that next time. Quiet room, pay attention. But as you were saying that, I, I think I know what that feels like already. I'm pretty sure I've experienced that, but I can be a bit more aware of it next time. A couple of things there, Dr. Lee. You mentioned maybe 10 minutes ago how 
when people read your first book and they read about all these incredible foods that they can bring into their diet to help them fight disease, reduce the risk of them getting sick in the future, you were getting communication after communication saying, yeah, but I'm eating all those foods, but I'm losing weight. And it's great. I wasn't planning to, but I feel good now that I've lost this excess weight that I couldn't lose for years. And I think there's something really powerful about that. They weren't trying to, but by focusing on the right foods. And of course, in your first book, they're all whole foods. They're all foods that come from nature. We'll be back to the conversation in just a moment. Now, many of us struggle to find time to eat all of these incredible whole foods. That's why I'm a big fan of good quality whole food supplements like this one that's been in my own life for over three years now. It contains over 75 whole food source ingredients, vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and it can help us support our energy, focus, digestion, and our immune system. Athletic Greens are giving my audience a fantastic offer. One year's free supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first order. You can see all the details at athleticgreens.com forward slash live more, or simply click on the link below. Now, back to the conversation foods that have been consumed by cultures for hundreds, if not thousands of years. That's fascinating to me. How does that and what you just said about chilies and how they and other foods can impact brown fat, how does that fit in with the calorie model? Because let's say, for example, Dr. Lee, those people writing into you, let's say they were having lots of ultra processed foods initially, and they then move to a lot of the whole foods you recommend. Well, Whole foods tend to keep us fuller, quicker, right? It's very hard to overeat whole foods. And I'm sure some of the benefit was that they were also naturally getting full earlier, so not overeating. But some of the studies that you've referenced in your new book where they've controlled calories, you know, you've been very clear with how you write up these studies and you said they were all calorie controlled. They were all doing this so that we can actually draw good conclusions at the end. It suggests that for the same amount of calories consumed, by changing the nature of those calories, we can have a very profound impact on weight loss. Is that fair? Is that Have I interpreted what you said in your book correctly? Do you agree with that? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's exactly the point is that, um, you know, they talk about empty calories and the quality of your food and whether there's something's nutrient dense. Look, <clears throat> I try not to overuse the word calorie in my book because I think there's so much um, association in the public with calories, calories in, calories out, counting calories, that it's actually almost lost its true meaning. And so I try to um, equate the idea of calories with fuel. And again, I want to come back to how you can use your body to actually naturally burn calories, uh, burn fuel. Okay. So, uh, you know, there's this current practice that's viewed as a fad called intermittent fasting. And I write about this in my book as well. I don't call it a fad. I don't call it a, a, a you know, it's not a, it's not a new religious practice. Look, um, intermittent fasting is one of the most natural things that we do in our lives as as humans. And the reason is when we're sleeping, we're not eating. When we're not eating. That happens to be called fasting. And there's a key to the metabolism here that is really, really important to understand. And that is this. When we're awake and we're eating food, remember I told you, put you put food in your body, your insulin goes up with a dip and neck and draws energy into our body. Our metabolism is hardwired so that when we're actually eating, its focus is really on storing energy, including loading up fat, all right? When we're awake and eating, we're storing energy. We're not burning it, all right? Now, of course, if you're walking around, you're exercising, you're going to be burning it as well, but you're usually not exercising while you're eating, right? It's sort of like you're waking hours, all right? So um, you're, you're, then you'd be burning down some of that fuel. One, but our metabolism is, is geared to storing, not burning. When we're sleeping, our insulin level, not eating, our insulin levels go down. When insulin levels down, our metabolism shifts gears and it says, Oh, you know what? We're not eating anymore. We're not, we're not getting fuel in. Let's focus now on burning calories. So in point of fact, it can draw energy from fuel from the fat, stored fat and burn them down. So in fact, when we're sleeping and we're not eating, 
our metabolism is naturally shifting into fuel burning, fat burning mode. So that's like at a baseline how we actually work. Now, when we're sleep, when we get up in the morning, okay, uh, and of course the quality of sleep, we want to get really good quality REM sleep that actually works a lot better. And we want to sleep as much as we can, eight hours being sort of still very much that kind of general good number, uh, seven to eight hours of good quality sleep being very, very important for your metabolism as well as your immunity and so many other uh, aspects. But here's where some of the patterns can actually make a big difference. In addition to the food that we actually choose, for example, the more time we give our metabolism to burn down energy in fat burning mode, the better off we are, okay? The more, more we are burning fuel. So here's a common thing. Um, if you don't get, so get eight hours of sleep. Let's say that you go to bed at, at 11 and you get up at seven in the morning. Let's say, you know, I'm just using these numbers as an example. Um, let's say eight hours of sleep. Now, when you eat dinner, this is what I do. When I, when I eat dinner the night before, let's say I eat at seven o'clock and I put my dishes away at eight o'clock. I'm done eating, put my dishes away. Now, in the past, and I know a lot of people do this, I might have earlier in my life gone to snack in the evening or maybe even gotten a bedtime snack. Before I go to bed, I'm going to eat one more thing. All right. I don't do that anymore. I do that. What I do now is when I put my dishes away, whatever time it is, let's say I eat at, I eat dinner at seven. I sit for meal at seven. I stop eating at eight. When I put my dishes away, I don't eat anything after that. I'm done. Now from eight to 11, I've gained three extra hours where my metabolism can tap into and burn my fuel down. That three extra hours makes a difference because now I'm going to add it to the eight hours of sleep I'm going to get. Now I've got 11 hours of fat burning, fuel burning time. Mm. Now, when I get up in the morning, I don't do what my mother told me to do when I was a kid, right? Our moms always tell us, hurry up, get up, eat breakfast, get on the school bus and get to school. All right. And now when I get up, I, I what I do is I take my time getting ready, take a shower, I get dressed. I might go for a walk. I might read a book. I might check my emails. I'll do something. I don't eat breakfast right away out of reflex like we were taught to do, conditioned to do. But I usually wait for an hour before I sit down to eat something. Now I've gained an extra hour for my metabolism to burn it. Do the math. Three hours after dishes away to bedtime, eight hours of bedtime, and one extra hour um, in the morning. That's 12 hours. That's half the day that I've now taken, 12 hours over 24, that I've allowed my body to be, my metabolism to be in fuel-burning, calorie-consuming mode. Now, it's true. We may actually have calories that have a fuel that's accumulated from yesterday, from the day before, from last weekend, from the holidays. We got more and more to do it. And it's true. We do need to be physically active. In fact, in my, in my book that I write, you can work out, you can get a trainer, but you know, uh, but even walking yeah. for 30 minutes will actually be useful. And in fact, even fidgeting, you know, that's shaky, the leg tap, 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 even that burns calories as well. So before even talking about what foods we should eat and the volume that we should actually eat, the timing is not just only what we eat, but how we eat and when we eat can actually make a difference as well. That's actually quite important. It's a, it's a nuance within, you know, showing a list of 150 great foods to eat that can turn on your, your, your fat burning and, turn, and increase your metabolism and heal your metabolism. How, how and when we eat actually can be also very, very important. Yeah, thank you for outlining that. I completely agree. 12 hours in every 24-hour period without food, I have seen is achievable for most of my patients. It, it really is very, very achievable. And for those people who are unable to, it's probably because their metabolism is maybe not broken, but but not functioning as well as it could do. And you know, we need to make some improvements so that they can go for 12 hours without food. So I think that's a very safe and consistent recommendation that pretty much all of us would benefit from. There's also studies, circadian biology studies, Dr. Lee, showing people having the same amount of food in the day, but at different times. There was one study, I think, in Spain when they front loaded the food. So you'd have most of your food quantity in the first half of the day. I think by 3 p.m., they'd had most of their food in a very light dinner. And when they did it the other way, when they had a heavy dinner, same foods, there was a significant change in body fat composition for the better when people front loaded. Again, it's highly individual. You know, everyone's going to react slightly differently. We've got to figure out what works for us. But I think this nuance that you speak to in the new book, I think so important because 
it's not just as simple as, you know, looking at the calorie counter on the food that you're taking in. Yeah, I, I will acknowledge that for some people that seems to work. Fine. I've never found it helpful in practice with patients, but I'm I'm not going to, you know, write something off that let's say some personal trainers have found useful with their clients, right? I, I understand there's different ways to meet your goal of losing excess fat. But I think this idea that certain foods can certainly stack the odds more in your favor, I think is a very powerful argument for people to take. And a lot of these foods are frankly delicious. What is some of your favorite foods to talk about in relation to this? You mentioned chilies. I get asked this question all the time. Dr. Lee, what diet do you, are you on? And I say, I'm not on a diet. They say, well, then what do you eat? And I actually say, you know, it's very different. I, I, I eat different things every day. So I can't give you the one food that I eat all the time that's my secret. But I will tell you my secret, uh, which is no longer a secret because I read about my book, is there's a, is there's a way, a style I, I call it Mediterranean eating. Mediterranean is I naturally gravitate because I've lived in the Mediterranean. I've also have an Asian background. These are two foods that I actually really resonate with. Um, I love the taste. And by the way, they happen to come from two of the healthiest culinary traditions of the world, right? Mediterranean and Asian, at least traditional cultures have been always very, very health, healthy and healthy ingredients, um, healthy combinations. And so to me, there's like, you can't go wrong by choosing either Mediterranean or Asian genre foods. This isn't necessarily fusion, by the way. It's a, it's a spectrum. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, that's my answer in present day. I will tell you what's really awesome about med- the idea of Mediterranean um, uh, foods eating is that it's been done thousands of years ago because back in the day of the Silk Road, which was the greatest human trading route in history, uh, it connected China, uh, Asia with Europe and the Mediterranean specifically. People on camelback were trading goods and selling silk and many other goods, but they were sharing their ingredients and sharing their recipes and sharing food together. And really, this is this blending and amalgamation dating back 2000 years of, of culinary heritage that tastes really great. So let me just take you through the grocery store quickly of some of the things that catch my eye. I go into the grocery store and the produce, first thing I go to the produce section, I love fresh foods. I'll look at tomatoes. Okay. Tomatoes are originally from Latin America, but they've been, they're now popular, not only in the Mediterranean, but also even in, in Asia. In China, they cook with tomatoes now and they grow them. I will look at tomatoes um, uh, during the summertime. Avocados. I love avocados. A great source of dietary fiber, surprisingly, because they don't taste very fibrousy. Um, and they've got avocatin B, a substance that actually um, fights uh, white fat and lights up brown fat. Tomatoes have lycopene, by the way. Uh, lycopene uh, is a fat-soluble substance. It actually dissolves, it fights it lights up brown fat. It fights harmful body fat. The, f- the really cool thing about lycopene in tomatoes, and this has been studied in humans, when you eat lycopene, lycopene containing foods like tomatoes or watermelon or guava or papaya, actually the lycopene gets absorbed in our bloodstream. And you know where it goes? It immediately goes to the fat in our body, first in our belly fat, then in our thighs, then in our butt. It's and, and, and there it's kind of like a it's sort of like a fat fighting bomb that gets implanted into your fat to fight fat right where it needs to be fought. The battle needs to be fought, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, I look at uh, greens. I like leafy greens, brassica. Uh, you know, what, people think about uh, broccoli, but I, I I write about broccolini, gailan, uh, bok choy, baby bok choy. Again, these are vegetables. You saute with a little garlic and extra virgin olive oil. Um, you know, yeah. uh, you, you blanch it. You can stir fry it, add a little oyster sauce or soy sauce. Man, you can make amazing tasty dishes with it. Um, you can make a stew out of it. You can make a smoothie out of it. You can make a soup out of it. So many delicious ways of, of looking for chili peppers. I actually like to cook with chili peppers. Um, uh, and it's a whole gamut, hundreds yeah. of chili peppers out there you can buy in the market. You have to find the ones that actually suit your tolerability and your, your taste buds uh, to be good. Mushrooms, love mushrooms. Maitake mushrooms on the grill, roasted, um, what, simple white button mushrooms, porcini mushrooms, morels, um, enoki mushrooms, put them into some miso soup with soy, edamame in the market. These are some of the fat finding ingredients. I'm putting them in the context of how I would love to see them on my plate or, or on a menu of what I would actually order. All very reasonable. 
middle aisle. I talk about studies with canned beans that can actually shrink your waistline by fighting visceral fat um, by eating them. Lentils, other legumes, dried chili peppers again, uh, dried mushrooms in the wintertime when you find it hard to find really fresh, a diversity of fresh mushrooms, get the dried ones. Amazing. Uh, tomato paste, tomato powder, canned tomatoes, all have lycopene in them. There's uh, olive oils, extra virgin oils. Look for the high polyphenol type uh, with uh, monovarietals. I look for picuol from Spain, uh, uh, moriola from Italy, coronecki from Greece. I look for those monovarietals. You can read it right in the bottle if you look for those. Barley, buckwheat, soba noodles. These are just some of the examples of the foods, the ingredients that are found in either the Mediterranean or Asian kind of um, genres that are absolutely delicious. And it's a small piece of what I write about that are yeah. delicious and good for you. Yeah, there's, there's a section in the book, which is beautiful, where you put the 10 principles for eating Mediterranean. I won't go through them all. You've covered a couple of them. Skip a meal or two, go for fresh. Respect tradition. I really like that section that you wrote about. And you ended it with something that I think speaks to what you what you just said. Take advantage of the wisdom of centuries. When it comes to healthy foods, newer inventions are rarely better. That was profound, Dr. Lee, because, you know, it's been said many ways, like eat the foods that your grandparents would eat or however we want to talk about it. But, you know, there's nothing that fancy and new. Like if we eat in that old fashioned way, most of the time we're going to benefit. So that's a very powerful section in the book, which I think people are going to benefit from. I wonder if we've got time to squeeze in a couple of quick things, which I think would sure. really benefit the audience. One is fish and omega-3s. First of all, I want to cover fish, but then also metabolism and these four different areas which you write so beautifully about. I think those would be two really lovely things to sort of end this conversation with if we have time. Let's dive into the seafood. So when I set out to write Eat to Beat Your Diet, I had these conversations with my publisher. And I said, you know, I, I really need to write about uh, seafood, fish, because omega-3 fatty acids happen to be uh, uh, fat fighting, metabolism activating, and they activate brown fat as well. And the feedback I got from the editor was, you know, be very careful about seafood. Many people don't like fish, uh, so we don't want to be, you know, putting too much information on it. I decided to write an entire chapter about it, okay? And the reason I decided to do it, because it's so important when you think about delicious foods that adequately represent uh, eating tradi culinary traditions, you know, so much of humanity lives on the coast, and those people who live on the coast live off the sea. Yeah. And to, to, to the point that, you know, and they, they eat seafood all the time. It's second nature to them. So I do think that responsible, sustainable um, fishing is something that needs to be uh, practiced. You know, so much of the uh, disruption that we have in our ecosystem has to do with mechanization, industrialization, this sort of, you know, overage and excess uh, without without being mindful of, of the consequences. So let's talk about, let's assume that we, we that you're able to go to a fishmonger or a seafood section in your store and, and find responsibly sourced uh, seafood. There is amazing. So everybody knows that oily fish are healthy for you, right? And, and most people go, well, I don't like oily fish. What are those oily fish? Salmon, uh, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, right? They're like, oh, those are pretty fishy fish. I'm not sure I like that. Well, I happen to like seafood, all right? And I've been fortunate to be able to travel to many places and experience different seafoods in the places where it's naturally caught, yeah. cooked, and eaten as part of the culture, whether it's in Italy, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, off, off the coast of Naples or whether in the Adriatic Sea or, or whether it's in uh, off, uh, Hong Kong, you know, I, I've had the opportunity to eat all these incredible dishes. And I tell people, if you don't like seafood because you don't like the way it tastes, don't worry. You just haven't yet had it properly cooked for you yet. When you find that opportunity, you're going to love it like the millions of other people that love this kind of food. So, the study that you're referring to that I think is amazing shows us that we don't need to have the oiliest of oily seafoods in order to get health benefit for omega-3. So this is a study in Iceland that, that did break out into four groups. I just want to uh, isolate the most important ones. They wanted to study the fat-burning weight loss po possibility of salmon. 
And so they were looking at an oily fish like salmon. Uh, by the way, how much omega-3 does the salmon have? About 1,500 milligrams per five-ounce serving of salmon. It's about the size of a, a couple of decks of cards. Uh, not too much. Uh, and they wanted to, and their their initial idea was like, well, let's compare salmon with a non-oily fish like cod. Cod is a white flaky fish, not very oily, not not terribly tasty. Actually, it's very mild. Actually, mm-hmm. I, I like cod. And um, and 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 how much uh, omega three does it have? Two hundred ninety four milligrams of omega three and about five ounces serving, same size serving. So literally, you know, seven times less than than uh, salmon does. And they gave these people uh, this this these research subjects either salmon or cod or fish oil or nothing three times a week for eight weeks. They gave them a little bit of a calorie restriction so that you can really see uh, weight loss or not weight gaining. But then to see if you add the fish on, do you actually get more out of it? Does a gas pedal go even harder if if you have salmon, the oily fish? Well, guess what they found. They found that, in fact, salmon did cause weight loss quite dramatically in conjunction with, with restricting some calories, about 15 pounds over eight weeks, just three times a week, two decks of cards of salmon, pretty profound. By the way, they have to eat the skin because most of the omega-3 is actually in the skin of salmon, not so much in the flesh. Now, but the real surprise is that the people who had the least oily fish, the cod that has seven times less omega-3s than salmon per serving, okay, they actually lost 10 pounds in eight weeks eating cod only three times a week. So the, the, the real kind of jaw-dropping, eye-opening discovery here is that we don't need to have the oiliest of oily fish in order to get benefit when it comes to our metabolism and fighting body fat. You can lose 10 pounds in eight weeks by eating cod, which is not that oily. So that opens up yeah. The gate, heaven's gate to looking at other seafoods. Because remember, we used to say, well, you know, you got to go for the oiliest of the oiliest seafoods. All oh, the other ones, never mind. They're not oily enough. Well, if cod's good enough to do it, with have enough, if, if the omega-3 in a cod, 284 milligrams is enough to do it, then we can then figure out how many other seafoods do you need to eat in order to get the same amount as uh, uh, five ounces of cotton? Well, I'll give you some examples. And I and I pepper my whole section on yeah. seafood. So if you're a seafood lover, please read my chapter. You're going to find out amazing seafoods yeah. there that I enjoy that most people have. I'm quite sure this is the only book with the word diet on the cover that talks about mitten crab and mantis shrimp and razor clams. But <laughs> it's a th- it's a deep dive that chapter. I mean, I was reading about types of seafood I, I wasn't even aware existed. So it's a really really fascinating read. Also, we must just cover for that person who's listening who is choosing to be vegan for whatever reason they're choosing to be vegan. And you just said all the benefits of fish and omega threes. You do cover this in the book, but could you just explain what you would ask them to do to to try and get those health benefits? Sure. Look, uh, omega threes are originally in seafood. They're they're in plankton, so it's sort of the plant of the sea. So you can actually get the uh, omega three precursor, amino levulinic acid, actually from uh, certain plants as well. Okay. Or you can actually, which then your body will process and create to a certain extent, omega, uh, omega three is very similar, uh, uh, t- uh, to what you would get in fish if you're a vegan. But honestly, what I tell my, uh, the people who are vegans who ask me, it's totally fine to get a high quality marine omega three supplement. You, you can actually have the supplements as well. If you're not getting enough from your diet, it's so important to eat this because that actually improves your immunity. It has effects on your telomeres for long, for longevity and good quality of life. Um, I, I think that it's it's uh, not a big deal if you are not eating seafood, yeah. but just find other sources uh, to eat it as well. So, uh, but just so just to, just to really um, complete an arc here that I think people will be interested. If cod is good for you, can help you fight body fat because of the omega three. The amount of omega threes you get it's similar to cod. Four medium-sized golf shrimp, eight oysters, one forkful of mackerel, half of a serving of, of a size of a te- deck of cards of halibut. This is an example. Like, if you want to find out what the dose of seafood you need to get exactly what they found in this research study, I, it's packed with it. Yeah, I'm quite certain this is the only only book that's ever done this because. I looked for other examples and then I had to put together a research team to, to crunch out all these calculations. But the point being, 
that I think that most people who go into the grocery store, it may not be a, re- a reflex to stop at the seafood counter unless you already normally eat seafood. But I'd encourage you to really look for it's a little bit of adventure in a grocery store to look for all these metabolism useful foods. So if you're of the mind and you eat seafood and you're and you're open to it, um, please do stop yeah. by the seafood counter and, and compare the notes and see if there's something that might catch your fancy. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, you cover metabolism in, in a, in a bit deep way in the book, which people can read about. Just to finish off this conversation, um, one of the key reasons I wanted to bring this up is you outline some research which has shown that there are these four very stable stages of metabolism in our lives as humans. And it really fights against this idea that many of us have that, you know, in our 30s, when we get into our 40s, of course, our metabolism starts to slow down and we start to put on weight. That evidence is absolutely suggesting that that is not the case. Also, the caveat there is I know uh, women, when they become perimenopausal and menopausal, there can be a consequence sometimes on people's weight. So I am aware of that, just bringing that into the conversation. But just to finish off, Dr. Lee, how would you explain that top line view of metabolism and why so many of us think we're going to put on weight as we get older? Yeah, this was the most jaw-dropping thing that I researched when I was writing this book. Um, first of all, a few commonly held uh, thinking ideas about metabolism were either born with a slow or a fast metabolism. My sister was born with a with a fast metabolism, so she's skinny as a stick and can eat anything. Me, I was born with a slower metabolism. I f- struggled with food my whole life. How commonly uh, do we, how common do we actually hear that kind of sentiment? Um, the other thing that we believe is that you know when kids are teenagers. Um, they're, and they're eating two or three meals. They're bouncing off the walls. Uh, their metabolism must be going off the, off the charts. Um, and then of course, as you just alluded to that, uh, when we reach our middle age, um, we're naturally going to expand our middle because our metabolism naturally slows down. It turns out all of those ideas are false. They're incorrect, scientifically incorrect because within the, and the discoveries, by the way, to show they're incorrect, have been made just within the last two years. To me, this is the, the the cool part about science is that we're still beginning to discover more about our own human nature. So um, two years ago, published in the journal Science, which is one of the most credible scientific rigorous journals that focuses on discovery. A study was published by a researcher named with the lead author of Herman Ponzer, who worked with 90 researchers. They were stud- They did the most ambitious study of human metabolism ever undertaken in history. They looked at 6,000 people coming from 20 countries, young and old, men and women, different, different ba- racial backgrounds, different dietary backgrounds. And they studied the metabolism in all exactly the same way, which is one of the distinguishing features. They gave them all a drink of water in which the water, which is H2O, hydrogen and and oxygen, they tweak the chemical hydrogen, they tweak the chemical oxygen so they can measure it. So when they, when the, when the subjects drank the water, their metabolism worked on the atoms and they can measure their metabolism in the breath or in the blood or in the urine. And the other remarkable thing is they studied people, humans that were two days old, newborns, and they studied people who are 90 plus years old at the end of, at the, at sort of the tail end of life. So this is the 6,000 people of the entire human spectrum. When they actually looked at the results of metabolism, the first results that came out, the raw data showed that metabolism, everyone's all over the map, just like you'd expect, right? But then we now live in this era of supercomputing and really being able to really crunch data. What they did is for every person's body size, they were able to remove from the data the impact of extra body fat, excess body fat. They were able to subtract from the result. And when they removed the effect of excess body fat from all of these individuals, all 6,000 individuals, it was like pulling the cloak off the statue of David for the first time. They saw that humans all go through only four phases of metabolism from birth to the end of life. The first thing is that everyone's born with the exact same metabolism. And from age zero to first year of life, our metabolism is skyrocketing to 50% higher than what your metabolism is going to be when you're an adult. From age, that's first phase. Second phase, from age one to age 20, metabolism goes down, 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 down to adult levels. 
This is right through adolescence, right through, you know, people's super energy, the teenagers high energy mode, metabolism is going down. The real mic drop here is that from age 20 to age 60, but human metabolism from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 is rock solid. It's stable. It does not decrease. Human metabolism is hardwired. The metabolism is hardwired to be completely stable through the mainstay of our adult lives. And after, and I, I do know people gain weight. I'm going to come back to explain why. And then the last phase, that's the third phase. The last phase is phase four from 60 to 90. Your metabolism slowly sags a little bit to about only 17% that, that by the time you're 90, what it was when you're 60. All right. By the way, that middle port phase three means that 60 can be the new 20 if you follow your natural metabolism. So why do people actually gain weight? Why do some people have more trouble gaining weight than others? Because during those periods of time from 20 to 30s to 40s to 50s and 60s, life happens to us. Our, and, and so think about it. Our metabolism is hardwired. Mm-hmm. It's like the operating system in your laptop. It's going to do what it's going to do. However, uh, in our 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, life happens to us. We have stressors. They prevent us from getting enough sleep or from exercising regularly. We have horm- hormonal changes that can change our mood. We've got relationship pressures. We've got emotional stressor, financial pressures, job stresses, all these kinds of changes slow us down. And it turns out that that, that it, it leads us towards behaviors that allow us to grow extra body fat. So in this research, when they added the effect of extra body, body fat back into the system, back into that stable metabolism, guess what happened? When you add extra fat into the system, it crushes your metabolism. So excess fat slows your metabolism, not the other way around. It's not the slow metabolism that at the beginning of life causes you to gain, gain extra fat and extra weight. It's completely the inverse why is that surprising? And why is that good? Well, I'll tell you why it's good news. It's surprising because people don't think about it. It's good news because it means that we now have the power to be able to affect some change to fight that extra body fat in our middle years. We can now have the awareness that our operating system, our hardwiring is intended to actually be rock stable. So if we fight our extra body fat, that visceral fat, and if we actually stay active, Okay. And if we lower our stress and do all these things that actually help our fat be its normal, healthy self. Okay. Um, then it'll actually allow our metabolism, our suppressed metabolism to rise back to the surface yeah. to where it wants to be. We can be aspirational for our, our metabolism. It's not our genetic fate. It is in our hands. Yeah. I love that. I mean, what a walk through human metabolism. And there's a beautiful image in your book around that chapter where you literally as you say, lift off the cloak. It's like, no, you're not slowing down your metabolism as you get older. You're putting on fat and that's slowing down your metabolism. So it's like, what comes first? It's actually for all of us, whether we want to accept it or not, we are, you know, like you mentioned before about the tongue and the snoring, right? It's already going on. That's then slowing down and damaging our metabolism so that we think there's a problem with our metabolism. Dotsley, I think this is honestly such a wonderful book. There is so much in it that we've not even touched upon in this conversation. Um, For that person, Dr. Lee, who feels inspired, but who has really struggled to lose excess body fat before and really, really wants to, do you have any final words for them? Yeah. I mean, I think you should love your food to love your health and love your metabolism. If you align what you enjoy doing with ingredients that can activate your metabolism and help you fight body fat with um, your goals of health, you will actually start to move in that direction. And I think small steps actually have a big difference. Lose a little, gain a lot, and and it should be aligned with uh, pleasure. So rather than try to jump you know, off the cliff for something extreme, align yourself with what your goals are with something that you would actually enjoy. It's time to rediscover the joy of food. Pick those foods that actually activate your metabolism and help you fight body fat. You will actually live long and thrive along this way. Dr. Lee, it's always a pleasure speaking to you. The new book is Eat to Beat Your Diet, Burn Fat, Heal Your Metabolism, Live Longer. Keep up the incredible work and I cannot wait for the next time we get to have a conversation. Thanks very much. If you enjoyed that conversation, I think you are really going to enjoy this one about the top foods to eat 
to reduce your risk of Alzheimer's. Dementia is a potentially preventable condition. Your genes may load the gun, but it's your diet and lifestyle ultimately that pull the trigger. 